Okay, welcome everybody. Scott and Carol are in Hawaii. Yeah, the Patricks are in Roswell, New Mexico, which is similar to Hawaii, but in no way. <laughs> at all, <laughs> including aliens. Um, <laughs> and uh, just in case, uh, see, yeah, we got, a, we got at least one on there. Uh, we will have this Sunday spring forward and our normal tradition of giving me $10 a person. Okay. I'm going to take, I'm going to start where we left off last time by reading a couple of these scriptures. And uh, the first one, you can be looking there while I say some information that I said last time. This is Deuteronomy 26. And uh, so we have been looking at um, Sarah's uh, oppression, oppressive spirit and nature toward Hagar. And we noticed that God did all these incredible things. And if there's anybody on Skype that didn't hear that part of this message, which goes back a little way, God did some incredible things um, for Hagar. And it was all based on um, because Sarah had oppressed her and been oppressive. And God heard her cries. And they are very much out of the normal of the way God has met with other women in the Bible. <clears throat> and um, God was the first one in the book, the first person, not just the narrator of the book, the first person to call Hagar by her name. And then Hagar named God, gave him a name. <laughs> so, you know, it's much more than that, but there, that's pretty big. All right, Deuteronomy 26, and we'll read verse 6 and 7. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us, and this word afflicted is the same word uh, for oppression, same root word, and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried unto the Lord God our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. <clears throat> and so... What we discovered is that if, uh, if um, somebody is oppressive in their dealings and they cry unto the Lord, then God will exalt and de-exalt, <laughs> will bring down, um, and that these scriptures that we're reading and the next ones we're going to read in Exodus 2, if you want to go ahead and turn there, <clears throat> relate to um, uh, the fact that God asked Hagar to go back and serve under the oppression, but to do it in the right spirit, and apparently she did. And so God is visiting the sins of Sarah, the oppression upon her seed, <clears throat> which is the exact opposite of what should have been going on because Abraham and Sarah were meant to bring forth God's seed. And, um, and you know, all the earth and your seed will be blessed. But God said that to Abraham. And as we get toward the end of uh, our search here of the firstborn in relationship to Abraham, we will see a few other things uh, about Sarah that's a little bit shocking. Um, Exodus 2, uh, we'll, we'll look at verse 23, but we'll just pick it up at uh, halfway through. <clears throat> the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried. And, the, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abram, his, with Isaac, and with Jacob. 
And God looked upon the children of Israel and God and had respect unto them. Okay. So God, uh, uh, God had already warned Abraham early on that um, they were going to be uh, in bondage. This was even before the situation had happened. You say, well, how did he know? He's God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, figure that out. Okay. Work on that a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, picking up there and, and ready to move forward now. In these things, we need to know the Lord uh, in the inward parts. And what does that mean? It means that, <clears throat> that when it comes to oppressors and peop uh, those who are oppressive, God is no respecter of person. It can be Sarah. It can be, it can be anybody. And God will, you know, um, act based on that. And, um, and you see it all the way through. I mean, you do. Uh, again, just a reminder, when we get over in, what is it, 17 or 18, um, and God comes down. And he's going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, uh, and Abraham says, well, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah. I've heard their cries. And basically says, I want to see if they're, they're genuine. If that's, have they really been oppressed? And uh, that's the same thing happened with, with uh, Hagar. Same exact thing. God came down and met her and checked out to see if it was that. Okay. So, um, therefore, we should heed this warning. Whatever oppressive things we do now, the Lord may permit your attitudes uh, for an ex He may permit your attitudes for an ex extended period. But someone you love may pay the price, but will wonder why such extreme events are happening to them. Now, we know, we know that the oppression of Hagar, um, that, that her reward for doing that in the right spirit was that she had Ishmael. And that God promised Ishmael a lot of the same sounding things that he promised Isaac. And um, so this is the same thing going on here. It doesn't matter who it is in God's eyes. He comes down. If he sees the oppression and everything, then um, he will visit that. And or in the case of... Uh, uh, the promise to Hagar, it wasn't just the seed because he was already in her, right? It was to his seed or his brothers, as it kind of calls it. Y'all remember that? It uses, uses that terminology for Ishmael, the seed of Hagar, if you will. So now, what do you got? You got, an Egypt, you got Egyptians. What nationality was Hagar? Egyptian. You got Egyptians that are oppressing the seed of Abraham. But after a certain period of time, they cry unto the Lord, and the Lord comes down and hears their prayers and sees and sees that it's oppressive, and so he starts moving on that. All right. But these things are not the only dealings of God over this issue of how Agar was treated. Consider the similar incidents that happened with Joseph Joseph in Genesis 37. So turn there to Genesis 37. And this actually happened before Israel even went down into Egypt. <clears throat> this is Genesis 37. We'll read uh, ten, about 10 verses. Uh, 37, 19, starting with verse 19. And this is the brothers of Joseph speaking. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast, what well, was an evil beast? Them hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Okay. 
All right. They didn't like being low. But you see, why were they low? Why were they being put in that situation? Anybody know? What? Actually, in this case, it's because Joseph was the firstborn. They, they, they didn't like being low under the firstborn. Remember, this is the whole subject of what we're, <laughs> what we're teaching right now. Um, and, and we say, well, how do we know since Joseph was actually like number 11 in the, the sons of uh, Israel, why would you say he's the firstborn? Well, because a lot of reasons, <laughs> because the firstborn didn't get to be the firstborn, and Joseph's seed ended up being, his two sons ended up being the firstborn, but the father, which was who? Jacob, treated him, or Israel, treated him like the firstborn and gave him a coat of many colors, which represented the acknowledgement of the father of his son as the firstborn. Okay. And then it, just in case you haven't been paying attention, you say, well, that doesn't seem right. I mean, the firstborn, uh, you know, uh, it, um, Isaac wasn't the firstborn. Ishmael was. Jacob wasn't the firstborn. Esau was. Um, on and on and on. Jo Joseph was next in line. He wasn't the firstborn. Because it's not birth order that makes that. It's what kind of spirit do you have. It's all based, not, not all, but I mean it all based on the Father's heart. But you see that in Exodus where God delivered the firstborn so that they could come out and do sacrifice to him. You remember that? And he didn't just, he redeemed the firstborn. And he delivered the rest of the people. And so Joseph was, to, was meant to be that to the father. And so here they go. They don't, they don't like that. You know, I, I don't like being low and I don't, you know, it gets pretty bad. I mean, it's one thing of not liking to be low or not exalted, but it's another thing to be in rebellion against the exalted one. <laughs> you know, the one the Father exalted. He didn't exalt himself. That's one reason why Jesus didn't raise himself. People say, and Jesus rose up. Well, he didn't. The Father raised him. Did you all know that? <laughs> the Father raised him. All right. <clears throat> um, where was I? Um, see what will become of his dreams. Verse 21, And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. That's, I think that's good counsel. <laughs> you know, I think, I think Reuben's on the right. That's probably why he got a sandwich named after him. All right, please delete that from the, we want people to think I'm, I'm spiritual. <clears throat> um, and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, verse 22, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit. Okay, Reuben, that's why it's not a very good sandwich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's not kill him, but uh, shed no blood. Let's cast him into a pit that's in the wilderness and lay no hand on him that he might, that, uh, he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Okay, so he really was planning on getting him up out of the pit and taking him to his father. Um, and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, then they stripped Joseph out of his coat of many colors. This says out of his coat, comma, his coat of many colors that was on him. All right. His dream also showed 
that he would be exalted. You remember that, Joseph? You remember that? But guess what? He wouldn't be exalted because he's going to be exalted. He was going to have to come out of death, right? The whole thing that happened to him in Egypt. I mean, a, a real tough death, amen? A long-term death that he went through. So, so, okay, so God says, I will exalt you and I will be, you know, if he ever says that to you, get ready. Because the plan is you're going you're gonna to be a firstborn and that may make you happy, but don't be too happy unless you desire that because... You know, you might as well just be as Israel and get delivered from the Egyptians instead of being the offering of the Lord, Christ in you, giving himself through you. <clears throat> um, you know, I remember when I first got born again, and for many years after that, I'd go to different churches. <clears throat> and um, some evangelist or prophet or somebody would be up there and they would share and then they'd have everybody come forward and they would prophesy over everybody. Anybody ever had that happen? Where they, they'd put you in a big line and just stand in front of you and prophesy. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, standing there and, uh, I mean, I've always loved Jesus since I've been saved, but I love Jesus, you know. It's not like I, I love everything about Christianity, you know. So I'm, I'm listening, I'm going, you know, God isn't correcting anybody. These people must be perfect. You know, it's all just the good stuff, you know. And uh, that bothered me. Even when they said good stuff over me, you know, I'm going, well, do you know who I am? <laughs> do you know my problems? Um, but, you know, if the Lord ever just said to somebody, just broke out, and you knew it was the Lord, and they said, you know, you are going to be exalted, and I will da-da-da-da, and I will use you, and, uh, you know, da-da-da-da, you know, I'll send you like bread to the nations. If he said that to me, I would go, uh-oh. <clears throat> First of all, I'd go, let's see, last time I heard him talking about bread, it says he took it, he blessed it, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, and then he broke it. And then he distributed it. I'm going, okay. You know, could we just stop at the blessing? Bless it. <clears throat> but no, not if you want the firstborn to come forth out of you. Not if you want Christ crucified to come out of you. Not if you want the lamb to be the acceptable sacrifice in you. Not just for you 2,000 years ago, in you. Then... There'll be something you have to go through, but guess what? You won't really, it won't be what you're going through. It will be him in you. Did you know that? It's a completely different thing. You know, if, if you hear, hear what you're going to have to go through, you go, you know, I will tell Paul what great things he must suffer. Paul's going, I think I'm going to stay small <laughs> and out of the way. You know, that would be the Lord talking about Christ in you. Do you see that? The beauty of it, it's not just to him. He'll be able to handle what you go through. Do you believe that? I know you're supposed to say that you do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to let it pass for now. <clears throat> All right. Um, and they took him, this verse uh, 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it, and they sat down and ate to eat. Well, sweet brothers, you know what I mean? And by the way, this is their little brother. There's only one other of them that's littler than him. <laughs> this is some pretty old boys there, you know. And they they go, hey, let's throw him in this pit. Hey, and let's sit close by and have lunch. You know. Well, what about Joseph? There's no water in the pit. I don't know. Yeah, he can hear smacking away and glig, glig, glig. And let's just really torture the guy. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm glad none of you are like this.
I'm trying to get the Lord to show me who he is. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. Okay. So in that verse, you got two clues. What are they? Egypt and Ishmael, absolutely. Because remember, we're, we're hearkening back to Sarah and Hagar. Egypt and Ishmael. Oh, baby, it's coming. It's coming. All right, well, one of the things that I tried to, if, if that's for me, I'm busy. And if it's Jesus, I want to talk to him. <laughs> Uh, there's two, two things I mentioned a while ago or I mentioned that I would mention and I didn't mention. Did you get that? Yeah. The first one was, well, let's just start with Joseph. What if all this that's coming on him really was the result of Sarah's oppression but also Hagar's coming back and getting under and being uh, having that spirit of Christ during that time um, that all that happened and so Joseph the seed of Sarah is now suffering at the hands of Ishmael and Egypt if you will okay okay but remember this two things can be going on at the same time there can be a spiritual thing and there can be a um, corrective thing, probably a better word than that, a thing that is dealing with you because you're off or someone was off. Or, you, you said I'm saying. Um, so if this is the result of Sarah's oppression and of Hagar's submission, it's also God still trying to, to get his seed out of all of us. See, this isn't, this isn't just punishment. Do you see? And besides, this, it wouldn't be him punishing us anyway. It would be, you know, you reap what you sow, right? Reaping what you sow is not somebody punishing you. You know, the example I use is that, you know, if we, we've got an electrical plug over there above uh, Robert's head, and if I walked over and said, I wonder what would happen if I stuck this fork in there. You know, and go, ah! you know, why did you do that? You start yelling at the plug, you know, why did you do that to me? This hurts and it burns. I, I wouldn't. Just you that like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, brother. Or maybe it's a little more like this. <laughs> all right so reaping what you sow is not God punishing you it's you punishing you wouldn't that be right you know you say oh look at this cute little bug here I'm going to put it in a, in a little thing here and I'm going to raise these cute little bugs you know, and then he's just a little bitty and you let him crawl around on your hand and everything and you don't even, you know, and one day you look in there and uh, he's, gotten, he's gotten out and he's got a family and you come to find out it's uh, scorpions. But that gets to you, doesn't it? <laughs> scorpions everywhere. Do you want to reap what you sow, brother? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody in here wants scorpions all over the place. But you go, well, you know, you're the one who sowed them. You know, we're so out of tune in so many ways with the Lord that we, we don't sow, see when we sow anything wrong. Therefore, you know, we, we're surprised when things happen. Um. I remember uh, 
I think it was on Bolivar. It could have been when we were on Maple, and somebody came up to me, and they were they were in the line wanting prayer. And I said, "Was what do you need?" And they said, "Well, it just seems like I work hard all the time, and my ship hadn't come in." And I said, "Did you did you send one out?" <laughs> it ain't gonna come in if you never sent one out. You just standing passively around. Well. Something happened. Come on. Hmm? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> there ain't no ship. Stop waiting. It's not coming. <laughs> Unless you're going to start sowing in another direction, in a good direction. All right. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Verse 26, well, the end of 25 was going to carry it down to Egypt. Verse 26, and Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Okay, so praise God, at least somebody's thinking about money <laughs> instead of just murder, you know. Hey, let's make some money on this. <laughs> Um, and um, verse 27 come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites well I wonder where that thought came from what if the Lord said hey let's just finish this thing you know in the sense of let's move it on down the road and get it over with uh, and let not our hand be upon him for he's our brother in our flesh he's our brother Let's just sell him to foreigners and take him far away. He's our brother. I mean, my God, people. What is wrong with y'all? And nobody's speaking up and going, you know, you guys are, you're messed up, dudes. You know, nobody's saying that. It's like, okay, how much do we get a piece? <clears throat> he's our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content meaning well that sounds good to me I'm okay with that then there passed by Midianite mer merchantmen and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites now I have no clue why that says that but they see the Ishmaelites, and they got him in the pit, and then they decide they're going to sell him, and then all of a sudden these Midianite merchants come along and say, get him out of the pit, we're going to sell him to the, the highest bidder here, and that's the Ishmaelites. Anyway, I can't explain every verse to you, okay? You're supposed to come back and explain it to me. Work on that one. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. What's that sound like? Jesus. Judas selling Jesus for 30. Jesus worth a little more. <laughs> Jesus worth a little bit more. Praise God. Amen. Lord help us. <clears throat> um All right, so I think, I think last class when I was sharing, I ended up saying all this stuff, and then I started reading, and it was all the stuff I just said. So I'm going to try to read just a little bit this time so, we can, <clears throat> so I don't just say it all and then read again. In the future, Sarah will have many problems taking place among her great-grandchildren. Right? This is, this, this is a bit of problem isn't it? I mean, you got what's happening to Joseph, you got what's happening to all of Israel being in bondage. And you think about it, but uh, there's, a, there's a process kind of going on here <clears throat> because I'm probably going to just say it again, but there's a process going on here. There's a process where Joseph may be burying 
bearing the Hagar Ishmael fiasco, but he goes down into Egypt and he ends up with the right spirit, right? And then God does what? Promotes him just like the dreams that God gave to him because he comes up out of death. But he's down there because these brothers now, not just Sarah, these brothers have done this. So guess what's going to happen again? It's going to start all over again. The same scenario. And they're going to end up down in bondage in Egypt. You say, well, I'm glad that God doesn't work that way now. Well, that was the reason why I made the statement early on. I said, we need to, we need to know him in his inward parts. Because we, you know, we look in the Gospels and we go, I know Jesus. He's just good. He blesses everybody. And he'll bless me. <clears throat> so, you know, we... We, we get away with all kind of stuff, but, you know, you never get away with it. You don't get away with it. <clears throat> and you say, well, uh, well, on your dying bed, you say, well, I guess I got away with it. Well, what if, what if you and your so self-centered being end up, your seed ends up reaping all the crap that you've sown? You know what I'm saying? I mean... Uh, I would have thought all this mess would have just broke Sarah's heart to, if she saw it, you know. But Abraham saw it because God showed it to him about, not about Joseph, but about Egypt, didn't he? But God said, but I will bring them out because of Joseph. He didn't say because of Joseph, but it's not because he randomly did chooses. We think God's random or something. It's because he knows Joseph's going to go into this death and Joseph will be the thing that, you know, <clears throat> brings them down there and blesses them in the middle of Hagar. But then it's got to come back somewhere and it does. 400 years. 400 years. Man. All right. <clears throat> Sarah's abuse of Hagar was due to jealousy over her seed, Ishmael. <laughs> what a convoluted thing. Do you see how messed up all of this is? It's just all, you know, I'm jealous over your seed. I'm jealous over Ishmael. You want Ishmael? <laughs> you know? I think your seeing is off. I think your understanding of what's going on here. here you got a husband here. Why don't you tune into him? He talks to God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, give it a chance, lady. It might work. <clears throat> Sarah's abuse of Hagar was due to jealousy over her her seed, Ishmael, or uh, Hagar's seed, Ishmael as fulfilling what she could not because of barrenness. Okay, so there it is. You know, all, you know, how many stories in the Old Testament do you have the woman is barren and she ends up not being barren because God touches her. She was barren. See, you have, here's one thing we think, oh, she was barren, but God unbarren her. No, she was still barren. God brought it forth. She didn't. I mean, that's an important point. But how many of those, those ladies that were barren ended up really bringing forth somebody of God that really touched the nation? <clears throat> well, you know, I'm not a woman and I'm not barren, so I don't know how hard that would be. But I'm here to tell you that there's enough evidence in the scripture 
that if you'll be with God the way he wants you to be, he can bring forth his son, even if you call him Samuel or Joseph or whatever. That um, God is faithful to his son. Try being faithful to his son. Try, try that. Being faithful to his son. See what happens. Try being faithful to yourself and see what happens. Okay. I mean, do you really want to see what happens? You want to see where that turns out? You know, here's the deal. If God could just, like, do this for you, well, how's it going to turn out since I'm, I'm so self-centered and selfish and, you know, all these things? How's it going to turn out? He says, I'll give you two seconds. And you go, ah! Yeah. Okay, what do I got to do? Got something you want me to sign? I don't know, man. I'm with you. I am with you. All right. Well, you know why he doesn't show us that? So he can get us on his side quicker? Because just seeing that is not the motivation he wants. He wants you to want him above yourself. Praise God. That's, that's not a lot to ask. To love his son. To love the Lord thy God. This is what the first commandment. Should have guessed it right off. You know what I mean? Okay, let's find out what he wants. You know, We hadn't really heard a lot from him, but he's been up there on that mountain for you know, 40 days and 40 nights with Moses. So we're going to hear from him. Let's find out what he wants. Okay, here's the first thing I really want is for you to love me with all your heart, soul, and strength, and mind, and Okay, I got that one. You know, it's like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, I already do that one. You do realize there's fire all over this mountain, don't you? <laughs> we can end this now. So the story becomes further connected to Sarah's harshness when Joseph is taken down to Egypt by Ishmael and now the seed of Abraham becomes the servant of the Egyptians. Hagar was the servant of, the, of Abraham and his seed. Remember that? And because of this one mess up, and it didn't just happen one time, she was oppressive in her nature. Um, uh, then Egypt is in the advance and Israel are slaves. Okay? Uh, I put it's a complete reversal. He is now in the place of Hagar and must endure harsh oppressive treatment. But later in Genesis 45, 4 through 5, Joseph makes this statement to his oppressive brothers. Come near to me. <laughs> so he didn't say, get the heck out of my throne room. You remember the, the vision? Uh, oh, yeah, bow first. And then as you're going out the door, meet my head cutter offer. Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. I am Joseph, your brother. <clears throat> now, you know the story, right? I mean, you know the basic thing. It's going to go well for them. They said, oh, no, let's not just kill him. He's our brother. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and then take him down into Egypt. Let's just do that. We're good. We're kind people. Joseph's just the opposite. He says, I am Joseph, your brother. And he has every intention to do good to those who did not do good to him. It's called a certain spirit. Okay? 
whom ye sold into Egypt. So he makes sure that they know, you know, there's information here. Not everybody could say they're your brother. <laughs> right? You know, like, you know, I'm your brother. Uh, the ones, the one that you sold into Egypt. Remember that? And they go, oh my God, we're in trouble. Oh my God. I think even one of them somewhere goes, you know, I told you this was going to come back on us. You know what I mean? I told you. <clears throat> now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. I mean, these brothers were so bad, I'm surprised that they weren't angry with him. What are you doing alive? But he's saying, don't be angry with yourselves. Don't get upset with yourself. Okay? That ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. All right. So... So Joseph has, has realized all that God had for the firstborn. There was a death and a resurrection, amen? He's realized all of that. When I'm, I don't mean in his head realized. I mean it's come to reality. And, um, and he looks and he, instead of just living in a trail of circumstances that you over, you know, who knows how many years, 30 years, whatever, that you don't remember every circumstance and everything and all the details. And sometimes we tend to forget the, the junk we've really done wrong because we don't, maybe we think that if I forget it, God will. <laughs> you know what I, mean? if I, I don't remember. And he'll go, I don't either. You know, <laughs> but that's not the way it works. Okay. And so, so, you know, we... We forget that, but Joseph has, my Lord, he's gone all the way back when, to when he was a young boy, and he remembers with clarity what God said. And he remembers with clarity his attitude when he told it to his brother, brothers, which wasn't a right spirit, was it? No. And it gave fuel to them going, well, smarty pants. Even though we don't wear pants. <laughs> we wear robes. Smarty sandals. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know where this comes from. So, but he's remembering this. I mean, he's, he's drawing it down as, as, as realities that need to be connected and so he's remembering that and then he's remembering that he goes out to his brother and brothers and and uh, he's bringing them food so in his heart now he's trying to remember this story but he's going in my heart the father told me to bring this to you but he knows where he was still at in those in those attitudes right he was exalting himself when God hadn't done it. And God, God showed him, I'll do that. So, you know, so he's, so, so he's thinking about that. And then he's going, and then they react. And then they're, you know, they're upset before this and all this. And now I'm out here alone. I'm really smart, aren't I? I come out into the wilderness, way out into the wilderness where my brothers are. And go, hi, fellas. And they go, Ain't nobody around. This is good news. And so he's going, what kind of idiot am I? You know? So then all that happens and it's thrown in the ditch and then gets sold to the Ishmaelites and gets taken down into Egypt. And I mean, there's a possibility, folks. There's a real possibility that he started remembering the stories because 
this didn't go that far back. You know what I mean? Abraham to, to Joseph. I mean, Jacob is his father, called Israel now, but Jacob's his father. Jacob was the, what, great-grandson, grandson? Grandson. That's How far back is that? And he's going, oh, man, seemed like, seemed like we heard this story, and God showed up for this Egyptian girl, and she was a slave, and now I'm a slave, and da, 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 what's going on here? Maybe he's going through all that and, and taking all of the word of God that he does have from it. And he's also, so then he goes and then he, he, he gets sold down in Egypt and all these things that he ends up going through and, then, and, and realizing, look how low I am, but he became low. He became low. He, became, he started becoming the firstborn. You know what I mean. It's Jesus is the firstborn, but we're using that throughout to show the nature of him and how he has to show up, or there's not going to be any whatever. Not going to be the result of, of that, the fruit of the firstborn. So, so then he comes to the right place, and God almost immediately exalts him. And now his brothers are coming, and he's realizing this was the trail. This was the path. This was the journey. It was supposed to be like this. It was all ordered. This needed every aspect of this. This is God. Stupid me, I was always trying to figure everything out or do it myself. This is God. He knows what he's doing. And he goes, because look, it's all come to pass. Hey, guys, you're my brothers. Don't be angry with yourself. God, um, God did send me before you. I thought we killed him or threw him in a ditch and sold him. God did this to preserve life and not just your lives, but a whole lot of other lives. You remember the famine and all that, right? Why can't we hold on to the Word of God and, and, and hold on to the circumstances that we go through? We call them circumstances. They're, they're part of the journey. And wait for that to come to fruition, to, to, to blossom forth. You know, a seed in the ground. We go, oh, I did it. <laughs> There's a lot more that's got to happen here. You know? And wait for that whole thing. God will bring it to pass, but you've got to be in the right spirit. And it is his spirit. And, and um, so um, you, we look at that, you know, and, I, and I've told this story to a few of you, but I remember when I was in Bible school and I remember going through Bible school and then they came to me and um, Oh, and one of the things that, you know, I felt like I prayed to the Lord because they had different um, labs is what they called them where you could uh, sort of, uh, that would be your major. And there was car mechanics and, you know, this and that. There were all these different things. One was education and all this other stuff. One was music. And I'd done music my whole life. And a few, uh, some of the students had heard me play and they said, oh, you've got to join the music. And I went to the Lord and I prayed and he, he just showed me. He said, Randy, you already, you know music without me. You've been doing music long before you met me. He said, why don't you try something that runs totally against your grain? And I said, like what? And he said, you know, trying to control little children, education. And I said, well, that, that runs contrary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I got to admit that. And, uh, but I knew that it was right because I knew I would need him. Because up to that point, 
I just was always with little kids, I would just try to make them my friends and then they'll do what I want because they're my friends. You understand that concept? It doesn't work. It does not work. You, there's got to be boundaries. You know, if you ever have kids or if you're still a kid, um, what do they call it? Effective pause. then there have to be boundaries. It has to be. So I had to learn all that, and I learned all that, and then I went from there, and then I go to the mission field, and of course, <laughs> you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, because we have an orphanage, with this, which is what? Kids. We also have our own Christian school, which is what? Kids, which I'm teaching, and I'm the, the, the men's dorms, what do they call me? Boys dorm, Boys dorm supervisor. I had to get them up in the morning, make sure everybody gets dressed, brush their teeth, do all this, da 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 da, fall out for school, and then go over and meet them at school and go, hi, y'all did good this morning. Your, te your supervisor must be really nice and good. <clears throat> and from there, I, I won't tell you all the story, but from then, and then, and and as I was going through all this, you know, I was going, none of this matches. None of this seems to make sense. It's like this over here, and then there's some random thing over here, and then there's a random thing here and there. And, you know, and it just didn't make sense. What? Yeah. 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 I'm taking care of the pigs in the mission field. I'm going... I'm the prodigal son. <clears throat> um, but there were so many random things, and I remember going, how is this, what is the point of this? I would say that to the Lord. What is the point of me here doing this? But I remember at a certain juncture when it all came together, and I looked, and I went, oh, my God. I couldn't believe it because every one of those things were necessary and needed and I used them and it was all the Lord and um, but you know I can tell you that but it's not you hearing that and going oh I think I'll, you have to start trusting the Lord you know what I mean you have to trust the Lord you have to walk his path and be with him as much as you know how because nobody's with him perfectly I'm not. I want to be. I seek to be. I press hard to be. But I'm not. But I'm with him. And I know that if my heart is there, I don't have to worry about my life. I'm, my interest is his life. One of the things the Lord told me then was, and I'll close with this, and I, uh, was that um, uh, when I got saved, I went, I was living at home at that time, I think, I don't know. Um, I'd come back, I'd lived on my own for a while before that, but um, uh, was um, left home after I got saved and went to Bible school and I remember sitting in classes and I remember thinking of my mom and I'd already led her to the Lord thinking of my my stepfather but mainly my brothers and sisters and I said my heart just was longing for them to know the Lord to get saved. And I said, Lord, you know, help me to get time to go home and, and share with my brothers and sisters and my family. And as clear as day, he said to me, if you'll take care of my family, I'll take care of yours. And I, see, I heard that from God. I did. I heard that from God. And I said, okay, that's it. That's it. So I did. 
And there are times that I, at, during that time that I felt really guilty because I was doing so much for the Lord, I was not spending much time with my, my family. You know what I'm talking about? I wasn't really getting to spend much time with them. But then I would recall that, and then I'd go on for the Lord. But then I'd, get, I'd feel like, man, I'm a, I feel so bad, like I should be. But then I'd go on. I don't even remember the last one. Dean, I guess. Dean. But five children in the family. Stepfather that was mean as the devil. My mom, both of them alcoholics. My mom was the first one I got to lead to the Lord. And before it was over, I personally got to lead every one of them to the Lord. Every one of them. Every one of them. I mean, come on, think of that. All of your brothers and sisters, and you got six in the family counting yourself, and and my step, even my stepfather, my mean stepfather, worse than me. And it was because the path that he put me on, he told me to be about him and his family. And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, then I'm going to take care of yours. And I didn't have any, I mean, it stretched for a long time. It didn't happen overnight. It's like, well, what about, you know, you know, you feel like they're going to drop into hell or something. And got to lead them all to the Lord, and they all have the Lord. And my mean stepfather really got the Lord, all of them. So, I don't know why that... The Lord's having me end on that, but I'm just telling you that it is so important to not worry about the journey and the path because it's going to look random until he gets you to that place where all of a sudden he'll go, okay, you got everything you need, and he'll show you why. And you just be. You're not no longer thinking about doing. You just be. And it's it feels like life. It feels like it feels like it feels comfortable then because being over here in a thing that's random to you doesn't feel comfortable but you do it because the lord puts you there right and then that keeps going for a while you say well, you know nowhere along the way do you say well i don't want to do this if it's the lord you know what i mean because you're, you're messing up what's coming so you just learn to be with the lord and to trust him to trust his heart Father, we thank you for your son, and we thank you for your spirit, and we thank you that you're our father. You're not just God above. You're not just someone we're supposed to be afraid of because you have so much power. You are our father, and Jesus is your son, and that is the life that we now live in the flesh. And we thank you that you've done that, and you pulled us all out of various places and states and countries and time periods and and you brought us together and you said serve me live for me let my life fill you get out of the way get out of the way physically get out of the way of of my movements get out of the way of my life in you and so we're we're seeking you on that that basis we want you and you could have brought us anywhere, but you had us here, Father. And so we cry out from our hearts, we want your son, and we don't want to be oppressive. And we want you satisfied and glorified and happy with your son in us. So we look to you, and we love you, and we reach out with our, the arms of, and hands of our heart. We want to pull you in more. Jesus' name, amen.